So I'm just going to do the same thing because I said, they said pictures are good. So I'm going to have to take a selfie with you guys as well, and then I'll tweet that. Right, that's vanity dealt with. Right, so yeah, um, about me. So I've worked for VMware for three years. Uh, crucially, though, before I joined, I was a, I was a customer. Um, I spent about 13 years in the IT industry uh, working as a customer of VMware, so I've, I've sat where you guys have sat. Um, if any of you have, have purchased a UView set-top box uh, for watching Freeview TV, the, the architecture behind that was one of the things that I did. Um, led that, and also I uh, did a load of work for government around NHS, um, worked on some of the pandemic flu platforms that came out when we had the swine flu outbreak. So an, an interesting background, but now I get to spend my time working with people and helping them understand the changes that we're seeing in our industry. And they're fascinating, because software is changing literally everything that we're seeing today. We're in a world where we knew who our competition was. Um, a great example of that is the banking industry where banks required bricks and mortar to have branches in the street. It's how you recognize them. Uh, and overnight, someone like Tesco's decides they want to move into the banking industry, and overnight, they suddenly have the largest branch network of any bank out there. You know, that's unpredictable competition. Assets moving from being owned to being shared. So I don't know if you realize this, but Uber, the market cap of Uber is higher than Hertz and Avis put together, but Uber has no assets. Innovation has to move from this idea of methodical planning to rapid iteration. Um, and app deployment, people expect it to go from slow to instant. You know, these things have changed the way people expect to interact with IT. They've changed expectations in a way that we haven't ever seen before. If I can get an application downloaded to here for 69 pence immediately, why does it take my IT organization six weeks, six forms, paperwork, signatures, and a man to come to my desk to install it and ultimately find the DLL that I need isn't there? Devices moving from millions to billions and an interesting one for public sector, organizations who were built to last, their very structures was about being built to last, now built to change. It's the ones that can adapt that are the ones that are moving forward. So software's changing everything, it's changing markets. We've seen huge change in the transport market. I was in Barcelona um, this week um, at the Gartner IT Expo, and it was really weird being in a city that I didn't have access to Uber, because they've decided that they don't want it there, that the taxi drivers rebelled and, and Uber basically got kicked out. And it was really weird, because I had to get in a taxi, then I had to say, do you take a credit card? I had to hail it first. Do you take a credit card? No. Oh, right, OK, can we go via a cash machine? And the guy's then saying, oh, yeah, we don't have Uber because I can get you there three minutes faster. And I said, yeah, but I had to wander around the street in the rain with my hand in the air. I had to hail one of you. Then I had to get you to stop at a cash machine on the way. I don't care that you can get me there three minutes earlier. The value in Uber is in the application and in the ease of use. And actually, even where I live, there are two big taxi companies in the little town. I live about as far, as far east as you can get on the east coast. And one taxi company decided to buy an app, and they have an app that means I can call taxis from my phone, and the other taxi company has a, a telephone number. Uh, guess which taxi company went out of business there two weeks ago? It, it wasn't the one with the app. Agriculture is changing. This is a great example with John Deere, uh, who are famous for making really great tractors. Um, and their market's coming under threat, because suddenly it's no longer about, do I have a really reliable, rugged tractor with nice big tires that sits and slows down all the traffic as it drives around country lanes? Suddenly, someone could build a good enough tractor, and what matters now is the data I can get off that tractor. What telemetry is it providing me? How, how humid is the soil? Where did I put the seeds? How much fertilizer have I put down? How much sunshine is that bit of the field getting? I can have a good enough tractor now, with all that telemetry on board, and maybe that's got more value to me as a farmer. And John Deere are heavily investing with our partners Pivotal at the moment in building a big data platform so they can pull telemetry off all the farm machinery that's driving around fields. So suddenly software is defining an industry that used to be about building rugged tractors. And accommodation. We see organizations like Airbnb, now the largest hotel provider globally by the number of rooms that they own, yet they own no rooms. So whole markets are becoming disrupted by software. And if you don't think your market is going to be disrupted by software, then you just haven't seen them coming yet. Software's changing products within markets. Tesla were able to push out improvements in the 0 to 60 time. They were able to push out improvements to the run time of their vehicles. They were able to push out a change to the ride height of the vehicle when there was a concern about them bottling them out and catching fire. They pushed that out over Wi-Fi. There were no recalls. How do you think Volkswagen feel about that right now? 
How do you think any other car manufacturer feels about competing against an organization that can just save itself billions and billions of dollars by just walking in with a completely new market and model? I was with a very senior person from a European car manufacturer, actually at Gartner, um, and they were saying, you know, these people are seriously disrupting a market where the innovation cycle used to be five years between launching new vehicles and new features and new functionality, and now Tesla are able to push out updates over Wi-Fi. Another great example of this product transformation, this is the Nest Protect smoke alarm. Um, it's a Wi-Fi enabled app driven smoke alarm that you can have in your house. Um, it's cool, I know at the moment my house isn't burning down because my watch hasn't told me that it's on fire. But the real use with this is far more useful information. So I have one in each room, uh, well, rather each floor of my house, and they, they tell me where the fire is. They tell me, there's like smoke detected in the kitchen, rather than everything in the house just bleeping crazily and you running around like a mad person, desperately trying to work out where the problem might be. But they had an issue with it, and they were able to push out the fix over Wi-Fi. While they did that, they were able to work out if they connected the steam sensor to the smoke alarm, they could avoid it going off when you came out of the shower, because now it goes, it looks like steam, actually, I can ignore that, it's not smoke. So they pushed up that functionality over Wi-Fi. They brought new features to the product. And last, but by no means least, well, that kind of happens every time Apple launches a new iPhone. Um, improved battery life, new features, software updates. The last iOS 9 update was supposed to increase battery life of the phone. So the world is all about software. Software is changing markets dramatically. And from a business perspective, it's actually around getting through this loop as quickly as possible. It's no longer the big eating the small, it's the fast eating the slow. And I can pretty much characterize any business by this loop. Be you a, a hotel loyalty scheme, an investment bank, a pharmaceuticals company, an e-gaming organization, an HR organization. We all have data. We all want to perform some sort of analysis on that data, and to do that we need an application. That application generates data, and so we go around the cycle. The people who go around this cycle the fastest are the ones who are succeeding in business at the moment. People may not have realized it, but that's what's happening. Google and Facebook and the Netflixes of this world, they were the ones who realized it's about getting around this cycle faster. Uh, in corporate IT, we don't tend to go around this cycle very, very quickly. Uh, in consumer IT, we go through it very fast. Every morning, I can pick up my phone and I can look at what new features my applications have this morning that have been pushed out to my phone. How often did you walk into the office in the morning, sit down at your laptop, and open the box that says, here are the new features the software has got that makes your life easier? No, it doesn't happen in corporate IT. The phrase there, innovate like a startup, deliver like an enterprise, that's effectively what's needed. And to do that, you need a different approach to running IT. You need a different architecture for IT. Because it's really difficult to do. You know, if you're going to build something and you're going to deploy an app and you're going to try and communicate with way more people than you were ever communicating before, scale breaks hardware. It's really difficult to do scale in hardware. And today's software engineering methods aren't really built for doing software particularly quick either. So what you also find is that speed tends to break software. The conclusion that you draw from this is therefore if you're trying to do speed at scale, well, that's just going to break everything. And that's really, really difficult to do. If you're not one of these new Bluebird organizations that's just starting up with a new remit, it's really difficult to transform your business to work quickly. The way you do it isn't really complex. You break down the way you build IT. So if you drive down the cost, size, and risk of change, you can drive up the rate of change. And that's what it's all about. How do I deliver an IT organization and the tooling and the infrastructure to run that IT organization that allows me to drive change faster? That's what's critical to business today. The civil engineering style of IT is dead. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean the idea that what you're going to do is you're going to sit down and have a massive big planning session at the start, like you might if you were going to build a dam or a new building or a new road. You'd plan it all, you'd lay the foundation out, you would plan where the foundation was going to go, you'd plan where all the holes were going to be drilled for all the vertical uprights, you'd do all of that. And if you then realized, having laid the slab and drilled the holes, it was in the wrong place, kind of screwed. IT traditionally works like that. We run IT as big projects. We have big planning meetings at the start of these projects to define goals. That needs to change because we can't simply define a goal in two years' time and expect the world to still look like it looked when we started doing the planning. The only way we can do this is to change the way we run IT. And VMware's approach to this is built around this strategy of one cloud, any application, any device. 
You should manage your IT infrastructure as if it's one cloud. You shouldn't have to look into multiple silos. It makes no sense to have multiple silos with multiple ways of managing my Amazon bit over here and my VMware bit over here and my Azure bit over here. That makes no sense. That's just building more silos. You need a single pane of glass to view that world and manage that world as one thing. It needs to be able to cater for any application. And you need to be able to deliver that content from the application securely to any device. So it led to a new architecture for IT. One that will deal with the traditional applications of today, the SAPs, the SharePoints, the Exchange, those applications that still rely on the infrastructure underneath to provide reliability and scale. And the modern applications of tomorrow, the so-called third platform or cloud native applications that rely less on the infrastructure and it's more around how you build resilience into the application. We run them on top of what we call the software defined data center. So not just abstracting virtualization from the compute, but abstracting networks. So people are no longer tied to IP addresses. You're no longer tied to racks, because ultimately that ties you to geography. And also virtualizing the storage, so you're no longer tied to storage devices. And if you can break those shackles to physical in just the same way that we broke the shackles between which processor or which server something is running on in our virtualization business, you suddenly have portable workloads that you can move anywhere and one of my colleagues is coming to present about vCloud Air later. But one of the things we announced at VMworld this year was the ability to vMotion live running workloads into the cloud. So no longer the idea of I'm going to have a migration to cloud strategy. I need to plan my migration to cloud. We're using vMotion to do it. Right click, send to cloud. Let's get a coffee. So hybrid cloud is the answer. Hybrid says that we're going to have a need for on-premise stuff. But we need to balance that with the stuff that's going to sit off-premise. Uh, Off-premise either in a managed data center, managed by someone else, or perhaps in a vCloud Air data center, one of our data centers, which integrates seamlessly with your world. You can just sit and look at it from vCenter. It's just another resource group that sits in a little drop-down, but you're consuming it off-premise. Same security model, same architecture, same approach, same management style, same operation, same everything. Oh, and by the way, when you move a workload to it, all the security parameters that are associated with that workload, they'll move with it. So that gives us one cloud running any application. With VMware, we don't really care what it runs on. Everything from build your own converged infrastructure uh, or, or hyper-converged infrastructure, things like the, uh, the Evo Rail product that enables you to scale out in a Facebook Google style where each node of compute has the storage, compute, and networking built into it. There's no more SANs anymore. I'll give you 10 pounds if you can go into a Google face, uh, data center and find a SAN. They don't, they don't use them. And then on the top, the ability to deliver that to any device, to secure the device, to secure the content, to secure the data, and to identify the user. That's what's needed to be able to deliver in this new way. Ruthlessly standardized, ruthlessly automated. This is no longer the thing that's going to differentiate you. You build the differentiation of your business on top of this platform. Of course, there's a challenge with this, and that's the challenge of doing all this securely. And I've actually had to update this next slide quite recently. It's not a case of when, sorry, if, but when the next one appears as a headline. Who, did anyone get affected by Carphone Warehouse? Did anyone go and close a Carphone Warehouse account? Anyone get affected by Sony, Xbox, had their kids locked out of their Xbox? A couple of hands going up. Anyone get affected by Ashley Madison? <laughs> no, so I do this pres I've done this presentation all over the world, and so far, no one has been affected by Ashley Madison in any audience I've ever presented to. For those of you who don't know, Ashley Madison is a website that you can uh, go and set up your account on, and, and it enables you to go and have illicit affairs with people. Um, the hilarious thing is that when they had the, the data breach, some people had actually been using their work email address for this. So you could trawl through the data. And I think someone actually did a graph of how happy employees are by their likelihood to have an affair, because uh, they managed to rate, rate it by, uh, by organization. And of course, this week, I had to add talk, talk to it, who have set aside 35 million pounds to cover the impact of that breach. That's really scary stuff. And we're giving organizations more information, and we're requesting more information from our customers than ever before. I don't mean credit card numbers. That's, that's bad. But, but it's not the worst thing that could happen. Because credit card numbers can be changed. You could get a new card. Usually, you're covered for the fraud anyway. It covers some inconvenience at the start of it. But ultimately, it's not life-changing. Who's got an iPhone in the room? Put your hand up if you've got an iPhone. Who's got an iPhone that they use their fingerprint to authenticate to? 
OK, so if my password gets hacked, I can change it. Who's planning to change their thumb if their biometrics get leaked? Yeah, it's a little bit more complex. The data that people are collecting about us now is far more complex. Google, for example, they track where you're going. They use it to deliver the data that provides the Google traffic system to give live, real-time traffic on the roads. It knows where you are. It knows that you stopped off with your friend that you met from Ashley Madison on the way home. <laughs> Imagine if that data leaked out, though. Imagine if it could be proven that, that you were, or every day on a Thursday, you weren't actually at the gym where you said you were. You were actually at someone's house around the corner. This is life-changing stuff. This is not my credit card got lost. And as we want to interact and become more personal with our customers, we're collecting more data about them. And we don't even know the questions that might be asked in the future. So it requires a new approach to security as well. So I ask a question. What's more secure, a hotel or a castle? Most people's answer is the castle. Big walls, moat, drawbridge, defenses, little things you can shoot arrows at from. Hotel, not so good. But let me put this in a different light. Here's my castle. It's my data center. I've got a, a lovely firewall sitting there. I call it my drawbridge. My VM's in the middle and some users accessing it. The problem is, this is what I like to call the Sony approach to security, or the dime bar approach. It's got a nice crunchy exterior, and then a kind of soft, squishy interior. Because very few people deal with things like east-west firewalling, the idea of two servers talking to each other in a rack. Who deletes firewall rules? No, no one ever deletes firewall rules, because we don't know what they're there for, what might break. So what you find is, we never delete a firewall rule, we only ever add more firewall rules as we deploy more services. Every one of those undeleted firewall rules, it's a little bit more Swiss cheese in the castle wall for people to come through. So VMware's approach is very different. We use a technology called software-defined networking to move that security layer into the hypervisor. So think about changing networking from having appliances that sit in the top of racks to one big distributed compute problem where every single host in your environment sits in that fabric of providing security. And it means we can put a firewall around every single VM. We can create DMZs around every single VM. We can say, this one just can't talk to that one. And if we ever move it somewhere else, if we ever vMotion it somewhere else into vCloud Air, that security policy moves with it. We can secure the users as well. So we can ensure, using products like Horizon, that we deliver this data security from where it lives at rest all the way through to the end user and consumption. And it's only by providing this concept that we call micro-segmentation that you can really securely build a data center environment that you know you've got the keys to. Because that's a hotel. You can walk the corridors, but unless you've got the key to the room that you're allowed in, you're not getting in. It's not a big, solid wall on the exterior and a soft, squishy dime bar in the middle. So, you guys have got a whole range of presentations coming up today. There's some awesome content that I know is coming up for you guys. Um, I was lucky enough to be at VMworld this year in, in Europe, and it was an incredible event. And it's amazing to see that ecosystem coming together again here. We had almost 10,000 people in Barcelona. We had almost 25,000 people in San Francisco. And to my knowledge, and a, a massive hand to the guys from Computer World, I think this is the largest catch-up event of its type that's being run in Europe this year. So with that, I'll leave you with a question. It's up to you. Do you want hotels or castles? And I'll hand you back on to your next presenter. Thank you very much. Have a great day.